eat. We do have restrooms. They're located down the hall. Us. I know that everyone has hectic and busy schedules, so I know it's hard to be where you need to be, when you need to be there, uh, but we appreciate you coming, coming out and joining us tonight. To start us off, I would like to um, recognize um, the people who helped tonight, and you see the coalition members that are around on the screens, and they're also here in person, so we're happy that everybody has kind of joined together and joined for forces for tonight. Let me welcome and start us off tonight with Dr. Jim Rollins, Superintendent of Springdale School District. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Megan Slocum. She'll keep us all in line. I can assure you she does that with me every day. I'm kind of trying to figure out this crowd, though. Everybody, we're kind of heavy over on this side. Are, are y'all thinking it's an easy escape or what? It is really a pleasure to have each of you here. Uh, this is the Don Tyson School of Innovation. I know many of you got to tour the facility uh, before we had our refreshments, et cetera. I, I hope you got a feel for what the school was all about. I really think that the teachers and the leadership of this school are showing us what educational excellence can really become. Now they would tell you that they're learning right along with their kids. And you know, I think that's what great teachers do. So I hope you'll get a feel for the, the program uh, of the school, et cetera, before the evening's over. This idea of kids learning any place, any pace, is really important. And uh, it's being lived out here at the school. Dr. Joe Rollins is standing in the back. Joe's the principal of the school. We appreciate you having us here tonight, Joe. Give him a hand. Would you do that for us? From the standpoint of the school itself, kids who experience this new instructional delivery system have a chance to not only earn their high school diploma, but to earn an associate's degree from the Northwest Arkansas Community College. That's pretty special to the kids themselves, and you can imagine it's real special to moms and dads. So we're really pleased about that. Next year, we'll have our first group of seniors in the school. And as we've gone through the model, we started with eighth graders, 200 kids. Those kids moved up, 200 more came in. That process continues. So this next year will be our first group of seniors but moms and dads wanted more. They asked us, could we have that experience earlier? And so this year we have a cohort of seventh graders. Next year we'll have a cohort of sixth graders, so six, seven, right through 12th grade. We love what we're seeing. The performance of the kids really is an all, at an all-time high. And I think here's the key, and I want to extend a cordial invitation to all concerned to learn more about the model. This really is a lab school. The things that we're trying and learning and making improvements in and those things that our teachers really agree are making a difference in terms of student performance, we're sharing that among all 31 schools in our district. And we've invited school districts from around the state and around the region to come and take a look and they're sure doing that. So welcome tonight to the Don Tyson School of Innovation and try to get a feel for it if you can. Northwest Arkansas is a very special place and uh, all of us know that. We are blessed to have great schools all around us, great teachers, great leadership in the buildings all around us and uh, to be a part of that, I expect every educator in the room would say it's an enormous privilege. I wanna extend the uh, opportunity for another very special educational leader to just help with a welcome tonight. Mary Bell Childress is our principal at Monitor Elementary School. She's also the president of the Arkansas Association of uh, School Administrators. And I wanted to give our president an opportunity to help with a welcome. Mary Bell, thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Rollins. I wanna just thank all of you for being here tonight to being a part of this great celebration. Who doesn't like to celebrate success? And I wanna start just by asking any of you that play a role in educating children in Northwest Arkansas, would you raise your hand so we can see who you are and, and where you are? Just like you, I choose to be a principal in Springdale schools and in Northwest Arkansas. I choose to have my four children educated in the public schools of Northwest Arkansas. There is no other place that I would rather work and serve, and there was no other place that I would rather my children be educated and have the opportunity to learn and grow. I um, have been a principal in Springdale now for over 20 years, 20 years of learning and leading, and I can tell you we have never done it better than we are doing it right now. Um, just this week, I had a reporter from outside of the continental United States call me, and the question she asked me um, was pertaining to a specific subpopulation of students, and she said, tell me what you all are doing different to educate that group of children. And I paused for a minute, and then I gave her an answer. I'm certain she um, was not helpful to her in her article, and I said, we are not doing anything different to educate that group of children because every single student in my school gets a unique and personalized education based on exactly who they are as a student and as a human being. We get to know that child. We know what that child's strengths are, what their goals are for the future, what their dreams are. We know where they need to grow, where those weaknesses are. We get to know the families, what the families dream of for their child. And then we build an education plan for each and every child based on that information. And that plan is flexible. It may be one way on Monday, a different way on Tuesday, and a different way next week and next month based exactly on what that child needs to be successful. We want every child that graduates from our school district to be college ready, to be career ready, to be competition ready, and to be innovative ready. And so we have to treat each child as a unique individual and personalize their education to make sure that that happens. I am excited about waking up every morning and going to a school, going to a place where I can provide that opportunity for children. I know you are excited about that exact same thing or you wouldn't be here tonight. And so again, I want to welcome you, I want to thank you, and I'm so looking forward to hearing about the stories of success in your districts as well. I want to close my welcome in this way. We've got a room full of very special people here tonight, that's for sure. Let me start with the students themselves. Do we have students here? We're so glad to have you. So glad to have you. Mary Bill's already recognized our educators, our teachers and principals. We're so very, very pleased to have you. I look across the room. Let me give you this, let me kind of give you this idea. You've all seen it before, but think about the power of collaboration, working together. Collaboration trumps isolation every time. We've all heard that, but the more we can enjoy it and experience and think together about what works and, and even what doesn't work, the farther along we will all be. So teachers, we're very proud of you and principals are so very proud of you. We've got a lot of special leaders in the group that who serve in legislative roles. Can I ask our legislators to stand? I'm really, really, and legislative candidates, how about, how about legislative candidates? Stand up, there we go. We are very honored to work with each of you. That, that's for, you, for sure. And thank you for your service as well. Uh, this is an important night. We've got a great story to tell. The districts in Northwest Arkansas want to share that story with the audience this evening. And so again, thank you all for being here.
One of the things that Dr. Rollins did not mention and Ms. Childers didn't mention is one unique thing that I think is one of the most impressive things that's happening in Springdale. Number one, we have the longest tenured superintendent in the state of Arkansas, maybe in the United States. Uh, yes. <laughs> And I would venture to say that if you've done something well for 36 years, uh, you must be doing something right. But nothing I think I've seen captures the heart of what this man is about and the mission and the vision of what Springdale is about better than this video. So let me, let me share it with you. The great calling. The great calling of the public schools is to teach all children. Our very future as an educational community turns on our willingness to adjust how we deliver instruction, to reorganize, if you will, to better connect yeah, all kids like, to the hey, learner. Where the heck is K? But you have to find H for you. Right, K. so you have to find A. And the Springdale School District has been the fastest growing district in Arkansas like for the last 20 plus years. In a district like ours, where we've been growing immensely for a number of years, people relocated here, a cultural transition, language was a barrier, but really just understanding how the local society works. So many of those families felt alone and isolated and just weren't sure in the early days of moving to a new area how they would fit into the local culture. Family literacy very quickly came to the forefront. Let's read the example. I have here in the Springdale um, 12 years. I have four children. I come to class because it's necessary to learn English. I help to my child with the homework every night. Last time on the hospital, my child was sick and don't, don't have interpreter. The doctor told me, uh, your child needs an uh, operation because he has uh, appendicitis. The next week, the, um, I say, I need more English for my children, for me, but for most, most for my, my child. Four days a week, four hours a day, moms and dads are invited to come into the school, sit right at the table with their child. What a beautiful experience that is to see immigrant families working with their children, learning to read together, learning the language together. And here we are now, uh, 13, 14 years later. Today we have family literacy initiatives in 16 of our schools. We live in an age of transition without question. As fundamental as this sounds, it's absolutely essential. You keep your focus on the needs of each and every child. And whatever differences might exist, and they do exist, if you can make service to those children a priority, you have a chance to be a part of something that's bigger than any of us, and that is service to all children. All means all. All means all. Isn't that great? Every single time I watch that video, it's just chills because it doesn't happen in other places. You don't see that type of partnership happening. And just the vulnerability, I can imagine when you started that program as a, as a school leader to say, I'm going to open the floodgates and you're going to come in and we're going to learn together and we're going to learn at the same time at the same table and sometimes at the same pace is just so exciting. So if you ever do get a chance to come and visit, that is a, a program we would love for you to be able to kind of see and experience. It truly, truly is unique. I'm going to introduce now Mr. Mike Mertens. He's going to give you an overview of all the fun that has to, has to do with the Arkansas Association of Educational Administrators, AAEA. Thank you. Good evening. It's always a pleasure to come to Springdale. Now we had two Dr. Rollins, though. I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to keep those straight. Congratulations, Joe, on finishing your doctorate. Um, when you signed in, you may have picked up uh, a brochure that looked like this. Uh, if you didn't, get one on the way out. And then you may have looked at all of these logos and acronyms up here and you said, 
I don't know who those people are. <clears throat> um, you see them around the room, on the, on the monitor, the around the room, and uh, uh, if you're a school administrator, uh, you probably know who AAEA is at the Arkansas Association of Educational Administrators. That's who I represent. And by the way, uh, our executive director, uh, Dr. Robert, uh, Richard Abernathy, sends his regret. He was planning on being here, but uh, many of you know that um, his father, Bill Abernathy, who was a longtime educator in public edu uh, K-12 education, also higher ed, served uh, in the legislature. He was um, chairman of the uh, Health uh, Education Committee for several terms, and then he was executive director of the Arkansas Rural Ed Association. Uh, he had been diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer, and late last week he had a nine-hour surgery. So Dr. Abernathy feels like he probably needs to stay, you know, uh, fairly close to home. <clears throat> so uh, who are these groups? Um, again, you may recognize some of them. If you're a teacher, you may you'll recognize AEA, uh, Arkansas Education Association, and I do want to recognize uh, their executive director, uh, Tracy Ann Nelson, who will be speaking later during the during the session. Most of you will recognize PTA. That's one of our that's one of our partners, and there's some other groups that are uh, that are. Uh, uh, listed on the monitor, and they all have something in common. Even though they represent different groups, they all have a focus on, on uh, education. How can we make it better for kids? So um, how did we get all these groups together? You know, a lot of times we tend to work in silos. You know, we don't pay attention. We don't talk to our neighbors. We work in silos. But uh, there was a basic question that kind of brought all of these groups together, and that is, are there things that we all agree on that when we talk to our members or we go out in our communities or if we go to the legislature to advocate for public schools, are there some things that we can agree on, that we can speak with one voice? And guess what? It's surprising how much commonality there was. There's a lot of things that all of these groups agree on. Now, we don't agree on everything. We don't agree on all the policy that we advocate for, but there's a lot that we do agree on. And it is remarkable that you can come up with a similar set of recommendations or goals that uh, we think will provide our, our state's children the excellent opportunities they deserve. And it's not just the, the groups that we talk about today. Um, uh, the Walton Foundation, uh, the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, you know, they do, they advocate for public education, especially through an organization called Forward Arkansas, and a lot of the goals and their policies that they uh, outlined would fit right in with the group that we're talking about. By the way, we do have a, a, a name, we, it's not really official, but we do call ourselves, when we're getting together, we call ourselves Arkansans for Quality Education. Um, so <clears throat> that brings us to why we're here tonight. Um, you will hear about many of these proven successful initiatives tonight from our participating schools. <clears throat> and while it's happening in Northwest Arkansas, there's no reason that Arkansas shouldn't be implementing these proven uh, practices statewide. Now. <clears throat> There's, this document is very specific about some of our recommendations, some of our goals, but they kind of fall into three broad categories. And one of them is that above all, we all need to promote student-centered learning environments for our children. Now, for those of you that uh, uh, have been in a meeting with our State Commissioner of Education, Johnny Key, uh, uh, lately, it, I mean, it's a reoccurring theme that he talks about is, uh, you know, he wants Arkansas to lead the nation in student-focused education. So that's, that's something that we all can agree on. And you will hear what districts are doing in Northwest Arkansas tonight to provide a student-centered education, a student-centered learning environment. And it may range from increasing opportunities for students that allow them to transition in either to higher ed or further technical education and then into meaningful careers. And it also would uh, uh, include um, 
you know, interventions and individualized plans for students who, who fall behind. So that's one of the, you know, major categories of some of our, of, of, of our recommendations. Uh, the second one is that we, we need to attract, develop, support, and retain more high quality teachers and school administrators. If you're in education, uh, you know that uh, you're well aware of the teacher shortage that's facing our nation and our state. And while it may not be at a critical stage in Northwest Arkansas, I can promise you it is already there in many areas of our state. Uh, just within the last week, uh, our Department of Ed announced the Teach Arkansas campaign that will reach out to our best and our brightest high school students across the state with information about the teaching profession. And then our third uh, general theme is uh, all of our groups support uh, uh, that schools receive the infrastructure and resources and the proper funding of educational adequacy that students need to move to, uh, to excellence. And research shows that an investment in proven education strategy is also an economic investment for the future of, uh, of our state. So, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Slocum and we're going to get to, to, to the part of the program that's why we're really here, is to, hear, is to celebrate our successes in our school. Absolutely. We have a, an amazing group to share with you. We've got the Pea Ridge School District led by their superintendent, Mr. Rick Neal, and I think he has some students to introduce also, so we will turn it over to you guys. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Dr. Rollins, thanks for allowing us to be here, and, and Mike for asking us to uh, be able to present uh, your true inspiration. I always tell that to everybody I see, of the work that you've done and the work that uh, you continue to do uh, for all of us and lead for us in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I'm excited tonight to, to represent the Pea Ridge School District and the opportunities that uh, we are serving kids. and. Uh, there's nothing better that when we can talk about kids is bring two kids on to the showing success, success uh, that we are having. About three and a half years ago, we started this journey of uh, college and career readiness in our school district and really putting a high priority on our current technical education programs. Uh, the set success that we're having is going to be shown tonight, and, uh, and that gives me an opportunity to introduce Ms. Kathy Seeger, our logistics management uh, director and teacher, and she really reaches out and, and to uh, most of our business and industry partners and does a fabulous job of connecting our students uh, to really what the real world is going to be really looking like. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Kathy Sigurd. Come up. Thank you. Uh, yes, I teach marketing and logistics. These are two of my success stories, but they had it in themselves. I just helped them show them the way. Uh, going on the fourth year here, uh, they get concurrent college credit through Northwest Arkansas Community College. I am very instrumental. I always said the best thing, I can bring them in the classroom and I can tell them about business and show them things, but actually letting them go out and be able to tour these businesses, walk in their shoes, and get that real world experience is something that I think brings something very unique to the program. These two young gentlemen work at J.B. Hunt and they need to get back to work because J.B. Hunt was very, very kind to let them come out. So I'm going to show you the video and then feel free to ask them some questions. Thank you. And when I first started here uh, teaching marketing and logistics, I had my own personal training business and I had a, a wife of the uh, human resources that uh, linked me with her husband. I got with him and then he directed me to Jackie Lawrence. So this started four years ago when Primba was, was, when Primba was started. Um, from that relationship I built through Jackie Lawrence and since now there's actually Ashley Bloxham. Um, I take my students twice a year. The first year students go, they get an overall tour of J.B. Hunt. They put together an amazing presentation. We get a tour. We get to actually see what the ins and outs of what it's like to work in the transportation business. Then the second semester, of their, uh, the first semester of their senior year, which is the second year of the program, they get to go on a job shadow. 
So they either get to job shuttle and intermodal transportation or uh, freight brokering or sales. So the students find areas that they feel that they like the best and then they get to actually sit with J.B. Hunt employees and learn what it's like for two or three hours to, to walk in their shoes. Since that relationship has started, uh, Ashley Bloxham came uh, up to me at the beginning of this year and said that we want to start a program for high school seniors that uh, we feel that can come and work there and get the experience they need. So my first uh, associate is uh, Brett Kirby. So I, I spoke to him in private and I knew that he had the qualifications that they were looking for and the time because a lot of the students are in athletics and things like that. So I had to find somebody that could actually go in at four o'clock and work till nine or 10, whatever they established. Brett went in and interviewed um, and then he had to uh, pass a background check and all those sort of things. And then he was hired, I believe he started in November. He was not quite 18 yet. And the Seeger brought up the idea of, hey, J.B. Hunt might be hiring somebody if I can get into it and look into it with customer, um, not necessarily customer service, but human, human resources is who she went through. And she did find something for me. I've seen a lot of things like opportunities in J.B. Hunt to work up and higher up into the management levels. And everybody that I know that's worked at J.P. Hunt says that it's very easy to do that. If you have the can-do attitude and you work hard enough, that's definitely something you can do. Well, I do graduate May 22nd, and around that time, I'll be hitting my six-month marker with J.P. Hunt. So that means that I do qualify for tuition reimbursement, I believe, with J.P. Hunt. Me and my friend Hunter White, the other one that works at J.P. Hunt, we both looked into it. We thought about maybe it'd be cool to do something for college and have J.B. Hunt pay for it and then we go back and help J.B. Hunt whenever we graduate. That way we have a steady job when we come out. Well, for a while at Miss Seeger's marketing logistics class, we studied professionality. So we go through handshakes, we go through formal greetings, how we should act in the workplace. And I've learned that over my life. My grandparents taught me to be mature in the workplace, that if I work somewhere, it's to my hardest ability. So it kind of tied hand in hand with that. but. Um, Definitely Miss Seegers would help. I would recommend going through that pathway if you are looking into a um, professional business job in the business world to go through Miss Seeger and learn professionality because she's the best one to do it so far. The second associate is Hunter White. And Hunter is how basically I got with J.B. Hunt through networking and that was makes me so proud of him is he came up to me and says, hey, I know that Brett is uh, working at J.B. Hunt, I would like an opportunity to do that. So I reached out to Ashley again, and in the interim he said, well, his parents have a business, and he said, well, I know a wife that knows a person that knows a person that knows a so person. So I saw my buddy Brett, and he got the uh, opportunity through a job shadowing. We went and he went to interview, and so I thought, well, you know, I might as well try the same thing. So. I got in contact with my dad's buddies, and um, my dad's buddy Tyler works, um, well Heath works at J.B. Hunt, Tyler, his wife is a senior advisor, so I contacted him, he told me to contact her, and then um, she gave me advice for different emails to email, and then uh, I eventually had a meeting, and then um, after that it just worked out and we had my first day. Well, being the youngest person, because uh, I'm told that I'm the youngest person to ever work there. And I'm a little younger than Brett is. And people, um, people kind of scorn me a little bit, the older people. But uh, a lot of people are, I'd say they're happy to see a younger face around. But there's a lot of younger people working there. But um, there's nobody really under 18, except for me and Brett. I've learned how to talk to people above me um, in a more formal manner, um, how to be professionally annoying um, whenever they're not answering me back or whatever. Um, I've learned who, you know, if somebody's having a bad day, how to talk them into giving me what I'm asking for so they're not upset. Um, I've learned to um, communicate with upper management better because my job 
I have to communicate with my colleagues and they're all above me. Um, so communicating with upper class or upper management better. Um, I recommend Primba no matter marketing logistics or medical, whatever the case may be, I recommend it to anybody that wants to get involved. Mr. Kirby and Mr. White are the only two under 18 year old high school students of any high school in Northwest Arkansas that has been able to work at J.B. Hunt. I'm working 35. Yeah, and, um, I don't have as open as a schedule. He gets out around 12:20 to 11:20 every day for uh, work release through Primba, but um, I get out at 3:20 every day. I'm a full-time student with part-time jobs, so I get out at 3:20, go home and change, then drive down to Lowell, and it's a heck of a drive. But I work, I'd say, roughly 20 to 25 hours every week. Yes. Yeah, guys, what would you uh, say to your classmates or? Um, I would say that you should definitely take the chance. There's sky's the limit, pretty much. I mean, you can do it whatever you want as long as you're, you know, wanting to do it. If it's something you're not too sure about, I wouldn't really put your full 100% effort into it. But if you're almost 100% sure, then go for it. it. It's sky's the limit, like I said. I would just recommend to uh, get inspired now, and then um, work your hardest and. Um, don't stop until you feel like you've achieved what you're wanting to achieve. So tell us a little about how you manage um, your academics and work simultaneously. Um, I'm in online courses, okay. and so at home I can work, or um, at school we have time to work too. Um, like I said, I'm a full-time student, so I'm um, part-time online for some classes, and then others I am physically in a classroom. So. Um, it does take a lot of time. I'm usually home by 9.30, maybe 10 o'clock every night, and then I stay up till maybe 12, but I mean, I'm a high schooler, so it's, it's bound to happen, <laughs> yeah. But um, it's, yeah. it's easy to keep up with. If you know how to manage your time, time management's definitely something you need to look at and be good at if you're gonna plan to work and be a full-time student. Thank you. Professionally annoying. I'm so going to use that. That was that was awesome. I know some of those people, so we both must hang out in the same groups. Um, this group is uh, going back to work, as they mentioned, but I did want you to know that you have, for the remaining groups, we won't do question and answers in between each one. What you've got is a note card, and you should have a pen. If you don't own a pen, which is usually my issue because I'm typically on this, uh, you can borrow one from someone who still owns ink pen and you can write down any questions you have. Just make sure at the top of your note card to please list the district so that we'll know who the question is, is gonna, gonna be related to. That will help uh, me and you both uh, to make sure we don't cross our wires. So we're gonna continue on. Our next school district is Springdale School District. This is uh, Dr. Jim Rollins and of course, Mr. Justin Minkle. How about giving this superintendent and teacher another hand? Would you do that? I get to teach a class at the university from time to time. Of course, my principals, when I meet with them, 
monthly. This, this may be my tagline. I always ask, do you have a pencil? They seldom do, but then I say, write this down, okay? Do I say that principle? Let me see your hand if you heard me say that. I want to come back to where I started a moment ago and I used the term collaboration. So there's just a term or two that I'd like for you to write down as we present our story of the Springdale Schools. Collaboration <clears throat> is really a major piece of our work. I see Dr. Charles Cudney sitting in the audience tonight. <clears throat> Dr. Cudney works with dis districts from across the region. You might want to write this down. <clears throat> we have 85,000 children in our service area. 85,000 school-aged children. In our school district, we have approximately 23,000 kids. This idea of creating a culture that recognizes the, the importance of teaching each and every child is critical. I've had the opportunity to stand in front of many groups over the years, and I've tried to capture what I believe is the commitment of Springdale teachers. It doesn't matter to us where a child comes from across the street or across the ocean. When they get to the schoolhouse door, they're one thing. They're our children. And creating a culture that values every child is really important. So 23,000 kids, 1,900 plus teachers, 900 plus support personnel, and then the moms and dads and business leaders and civic leaders and legislators and the list goes on and on where a culture has to come together to value each and every child. We capture the foundation of the work in our school district with this phrase. You might want to write this down. Teach them all. You heard that in the video. Teach them all. All means all. So for each of us, certainly the superintendent of schools and the principals and the teachers and the support personnel, if you can bring the work of your schools together in such a way that every child is a priority, you've done something extremely special. We do a lot of great things in our school district. The thing I believe we do best is take care of our children. So that starts with knowing where they are in terms of their readiness to learn. And then all the talents of our educational team bring their best thinking together in terms of how to serve those kids. It's really important that you create a system, a structure, where the input of every participant is valued. I've already talked about our teachers. I've talked about our principals. I want to come back to our teachers. From my point of view, some of the very best leaders in our school system are our classroom teachers. And so if you can create a system by which they can think together about reading, literacy, numeracy, the social well-being of our children, you've got something very, very special going on. And when you can create that structure so that they can talk about those things, again, as I said earlier, versus those things, those things that work versus maybe those things <clears throat> that don't work quite as well, you can make enormous gains over time when great people bring their best thinking together. I've asked Mr. Minkle, whom I consider to be one of the great teachers of our time, uh, to talk with us just a moment from the teacher's point of view about that culture building process, about the systems that have to be put in place to give every teacher a voice to bring their best thinking together in terms of the work that goes on in each of our schools. Justin, your thoughts? Hi, everybody. So I want to ask you to close your eyes for just a minute and picture a child who you deeply love. It can be your son or your daughter, a niece or nephew. It can be a grandchild. And then I want you to think about what you want for that child. OK, you can open your eyes. 
To me, that's what equity is. And it's so easy to slide to adequacy and decide that as long as we can get them to a certain cut score on a certain test, we're providing them what they need. And what I see as being really different in this district is we're helping every child to live the lives they dream. And that's the goal. And we see test scores as a means to an end. You know, one of the things I think about data is it can be really powerful, but it can also obscure individuals. And what I love about Dr. Rollins is I think he doesn't see 23,000 students in this big stadium. He sees one child and then another child 23,000 times. And that's incredibly hard to do. I think even as a teacher, it's hard to see those 25 kids as individuals and teach them as individuals. You know, when I became a dad, it really changed the way I saw my job as a teacher because I was sitting in a conference. They were telling me, you know, your child got a 194 on this MAP score and 186 on this MAP score. And I thought, I don't care though. Like what I want to know is, do you see my child, right? Do you see my child? What are her strengths? What are her needs? And the test scores are okay, but that's a, that's a means to an end, and it's a tiny piece of it. So what I've seen us do at my school, which is 99% poverty, Jones Elementary, is really take this journey from this kind of idea of adequacy, just what are their kind of reading test scores, what are their math test scores, to what do they need to live the lives they dream long term. And beyond that, what do their families need in context? So, you know, we have a clinic in our school. Um, we have a parent university that provides parents information on nutrition and gang violence prevention, um, immigration issues. I mean, anything that is on the parents' minds. And so what I've seen is that we're really helping to meet the needs of not just the students, but the students in context of their families. And I think that's been an amazing thing. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is we have this initiative this year that is district-wide that's amazing, that's really building a love of reading. And so kids are not doing a lot of worksheets, they're not doing a lot of textbooks. Every child has a classroom library with amazing books. And Dr. Weber and I were talking earlier about how important it is for books to not just be windows, which is huge, but also mirrors where kids can see themselves. So we have books that reflect kids' identities and experiences, and they're reading real books, and they are getting to those really high levels, but it's starting with where they are as a reader, uh, what they care about, and building that up. And what amazes me is I know how hard that is to do with 25 kids, and we see it happening at every single elementary school. And you know, my last thought, kind of when we're talking about collaboration, um, is you know, I remember former President Clinton having this great line that there's nothing wrong with America that can't be cured by what is right with America. And that's what I see about our public schools. We have huge challenges. Um, we have huge demographic shifts. And what amazes me about Dr. Rollins and about the principals in this room and the teachers is that when we had this huge influx of immigrants from other countries, it was never seen as we're going to divide us and them. And it was never seen as let's keep them out. It was let's welcome them in and let's find a way to teach all kids better. I think Dr. Rollins made a really eloquent case for things like this gradual release of responsibility that got kids doing the talking and kids doing the learning. This is good for every kid in the district. And, and it is tailored to English learners, but it helped kids who are native English speakers become more active in their learning. And I think that was this really amazing thing to see. Um, but what I think we've seen is that to build that kind of system, um, we have to look at our strengths. And so a lot of times I observe other teachers in our building. Um, this morning, Cameron next door went over to Parson Hills so he could learn from some things that they do well. And the last thing I want to say is just really a thank you to principals, because I think to do this kind of work, you have to balance coherence throughout an entire system, like this project with the books, where every elementary school is doing this, with professional autonomy. And so, you know, I was on a committee in Little Rock once, and we were talking about trying to give teachers more collaboration time. And someone on the committee said, but how are we going to monitor and compel them to collaborate during that time? And I said, well, you know, in my district, we really try to hire people we really respect um, and then kind of support them to get better. But if you don't trust someone to collaborate during that collaboration time, we can't trust them with 25 children or 150 children. And that's what I see in this district is a culture of mutual respect, you know, really building on our strengths, and then really thinking from that parent perspective about true equity, you know, not sliding down to adequacy, but what would we want for our own children? What does Dr. Rollins want for his own child? You know, and then really making that a reality for every one of those 23,000 kids, and at this forum, really all 85,000. So Dr. Rollins, I'll stop there if you had more you wanted to say, but thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much. Give him my hand, did you do that? <clears throat> I'd like to just close this way. From our point of view, and again, I talked about 85,000 kids in our co-op area. If we do our work well, and we've got so many, many great leaders who are trying to do that, great teachers that are trying to do that, and partners who are in invested in that process. If we do our work well, if we can help every child realize their true potential and promise, 
that really is a gift of a lifetime. Horace Mann said it this way. He said, the public school is America's greatest invention. I believe, I believe that's truer today than ever before. Thank you. We have Fayetteville School District up next that we're going to be hearing from. Dr. Stephen Weber, if you would come on up. He is the Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning in Fayetteville School District. And his co-partner tonight is Miss Anna Bollier. And she is the high school French teacher at Fayetteville High School. And they're going to get, share some information about Fayetteville. Turn it over to you. Start with a video. Perfect. First, I would like to extend my thanks to the organizers of, of this event. I'm inspired to see such a large group of people in one room, all in support of public education. Uh, my name is Anna Beaulieu, and I am the president of the Fayetteville Education Association. And, <laughs> what, what? Um, and I am a French teacher of 18 years with the Fayetteville Public School District. And I think by that simple resume, it it's safe to say that public education is my business. I love public schools. Um, I believe in public education and I support my fellow public educators. I stand proudly for public schools and I will always vote for public education. Um, Fayetteville Public Schools have been killing it uh, for quite some time, 1871, and I could not be more honored to tell you why. We serve around 10,000 students every day, which for some larger districts here, Springdale, that might seem a drop in the bucket. Um, yet to those smaller districts, you might be saying, thank goodness our bucket is not quite that big. Um, but to me, that number represents 10,000 curious minds who walk through our doors and look to us, the educators, to teach, to inspire, to, to challenge and to encourage. And we have the unique opportunity to light a spark, inspire a passion, um, and present a path not yet considered because we hold the belief that all students, all students can succeed and that all students should have equal access to the tools with which to succeed. So how are we doing? Um, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I would like to give you just a few of the many accomplishments of Fayetteville Secondary Schools. I'm excited to share with you that just last night, um, Ramey Junior High was notified that their school is a diamond school to watch. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and with the addition of Ramey, Fayetteville Public Schools can be the first to proudly say that every middle school and junior high in our district has received this award. In 2018, uh, in the 2018 senior class of 695 students, the top 50 students have an average ACT composite score of 32. The top 100, a 31. The top 200, a 30. The top 250, a 29. We have 11 National Merit finalists who've already been offered $352,000 by the Chancellor at the U University of Arkansas. 36 current FHS seniors have received the Arkansas Biliteracy Award for demonstrating proficiency in two or more languages. Last year, we had 898 students take 1,781 AP exams in 28 different courses. 598 scored a three or higher. 141 seniors completed a program of study in our career and technical education courses. Over $20 million in scholarships were awarded to the 2017 senior class, and 17 of those students are attending nine of the nation's top 25 universities. We have former FPS students in universities from California to New York studying abroad 
in political office, in the military, doing scientific research, directing plays, and just generally making us proud. You do not get that kind of list if you are doing things wrong. You get it by doing things right. Each of you representing a different district has a similar brag book of all the wonderful programs, awards, and achievements that your school district has. And good for you. And good for us. Because it's not about us against you. <clears throat> we are all committed to educating our students in an effort to prepare them for a future that will ultimately benefit our communities and our state. We gain nothing by putting each other down to bring ourselves up. So how did we, parents, students who went back to work, activists and legislators, how did we all get here in this room together? Dare I point out the elephant? Uh, we can no longer afford to operate under the false assumption that because our school is built, they will come. They now have options, and those options are aggressively pursuing them. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? In Fayetteville, we have worked hard to, ha to have the educator's voice heard. We've, who better to offer input to implement strategies, to develop PD, and to, to propose innovative solutions than the educators who are in the trenches with our students on a daily basis. We also know that not all students have the same needs or learn in the same way, which is why in Fayetteville, um, students have access not only to the more traditional environment in 14 of our schools, but they also have access to alternative learning environments with the Fayetteville Virtual Academy and the Alps School of Innovation. As public school educators, we cannot become complacent with our school's offerings. We must constantly ask ourselves what our students need, and we must offer choice within our walls if we want to contend with the external options. Fayetteville recognizes this need to be relevant and is working with the Northwest Arkansas Community College to increase our concurrent credit options, both online and in-house. By the 2019-2020 school year, we will be able to offer an Associates of Arts and an Associate of Science pathway. This year, we added a JAG program to allow students to receive on-the-job training while earning credits for graduation. And we will increase the number of industry certifications offered in our CTE courses, which will further prepare our students for the workplace. In the end, we must recognize that this generation of students is not like the previous, nor will it be like the next. To thrive, public schools must embrace that change is the new constant. The future is bright. Vote public education, and thank you for your time. We have Siloam Springs School District that is going to join us, led by Superintendent Ken Ramey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Megan coached me quite in depth to make sure that I didn't. Uh, she was a wrangler. Don't go past five minutes, Mr. Ramey. So I want you to know that that's my goal right now. So put the watch on me and let's see how we do. Uh, we want to start a little bit with our demographics and our data, please. Many people don't get off the 49 corridor, and we always like to have visitors in our school district. We are a tweener school district. We are too big to be small and too small to be big. <laughs> our little bit of our demographics, we're running about 325 to 350 in a class. Uh, we have um, some diversity in 1996. We were 96, excuse me, 1993, we were 96% Caucasian, and now we're 56% Caucasian. Uh, with a variety of ethnicities. 19% L students in the district, 13% uh, uh, IDEA identified students, a staff of 596. Uh, the Smithsonian Magazine indicates that uh, we're one of the best small towns in America, so come visit our main street downtown, shop and, and uh, have a good time and take a day off sometimes from your uh, political aspirations. Everything we do in education <laughs> is about Relationships, everything is about relationships and developing those relationships. The school should be interwoven completely and totally in the community, would you agree? Yes. To be supported, we have to give our community 
and their most our parents, their most valuable product, which is their children. And we must meet those individual children's need with the love and the compassion and the dedication and the fact that we do not want to lose one child along the way. So I want to talk a little bit about K-12 education. And uh, these are our partners I've listed down here on the right, but they're also our major employ employers in the community. We are big in a K-4 initiative in our district, in the reading initiative, certainly led and in, in, uh, taken off by our governor through our commissioner, but we have put in a significant amount of dollars into interventionists, into facilitators. Uh, for the RISE initiative, we have a district trainer. We've been working with the state uh, Department of Education have been in our district multiple times to work with us uh, on preparing the way. We haven't started our teachers through that process yet, but we have all of our facilitators, interventionists, and uh, our leadership. Uh, STEAM classroom, we started two years ago at kindergarten level. We moved it up this year to the first grade level. Next year, we'll take it to the second grade level. Gives us a whole class enrichment experience for our children at early age and see if we can't meet their needs and develop their skills. When at the bottom down there is what I need now. That's an intervention program that we do grades one through eight, making sure we don't leave any child behind and working daily in a situation where we intervene and regroup those students every day to figure out how we can serve them best. Uh, we do have the accelerated science. We started in the sixth grade this year. It's working wonderfully for us. We took some time to get some training, so we moved that six, seven, and eight. We have the first true middle school in Northwest Arkansas in 1993, and we're still using that concept for those children in the mid-levels, very important. Uh, you can see introductory classrooms and vocational. We are huge in Siloam Springs in the focus on vocational education. We have a lot of industry and a lot of manufacturing. It's hugely important. We went out in the community and asked for $2 million from our community to build a building and uh, did some work in regard to our partnerships to uh, fund and, st and staff that facility to make a difference for kids and career opportunities. Uh, again, interventions. We have the picture is with the piano lab that we have in the fifth grade in the, for, our, for our music program. Uh, our high school's been on a block schedule for 23 years, and we love the block schedule. Uh, we think it serves the needs of our kids. We converted our entire high school to a charter a conversion charter school, which gave us the opportunity to be more flexible with how we embedded courses to serve kids so we could open up some opportunities for uh, career and technical. We've started this year with the blended personalized learning piece, and we're at varying degrees of success with that, but we're working with Summit platform in that area. We do Encore advisory every day in our schools to help us for kids for career planning and and um, uh, also to meet in, uh, for remediation and catch up. We have a scholarship director in our school district. We've had that program for over 30 years because we have such local contributions in our community for students, and so we needed a scholarship director to help us find funds for kids to, um, to move forward. We have uh, over a 90% graduation rate. It's not 100. We need to be at 100, and uh, we don't need to lose anybody. We're working on that. We have... Um, a reading interventionist in uh, uh, four of our buildings starting in grade one and moving through the uh, uh, middle school. We are very, very pleased with the training and how we're working with our children in that area. And then we have the uh, instructional facilitators that work with our teachers. So we're doing that in a systematic approach. I hope that uh, uh, you can see the vision of that. Our, we we move moving towards planning and implementation of one-on-one -on -one for computers. And the adopt a school program, we have 20 to 25 businesses that have adopted each school, and they partner with us. So we, we had a bingo night the other night, simple as it may be, had 650 people at a bingo night. And we did that in Spanish and English and had a wonderful time. You have to get your, your families and your children in your schools on non-academic time to build that relationship. That may sound silly to you, but we were excited about that. Um, did I get that? Okay, guys. All right. Uh, behavior interventionists. We did. We started this this year. You can see our uh, sensory room. This is in our pre-K uh, kindergarten building, and we've seen so much uh, change over in our students coming to school and how ready they are to learn. We've um, our principal and our behavior interventionists came together with a sensory room that's really impacted us in a proactive way, if you will, because we also have a safe room which helps kids who are overwhelmed or 
uh, during the course of the day or whatever's going on in their home or life. So we have a, a behaviorist and a sensory room and a, also a safe room to help us. And then the Every Student Every Day initiative, I, I failed to mention the last one, we're doing that across the district because we know that we must have children at school. And so we're using those strategies to try to make sure that we value and tell those children and their parents how important they are to be in our school. Middle school teaming concept, there's the Every Student Every Day initiative. Advisory programs we have all the way through our five through eight uh, process there. This picture is of our Panther Health and Wellness Clinic. We actually have an APN on our school campus. We serve the families, we serve the children, we use transportation so parents don't have to take off work with their permission. We bust those children over to our uh, wellness clinic, serve their needs, do some basic lab work, immunizations, if you will, and also do some small group family counseling in our Panther Health and Wellness Clinic. Uh, uh, high school, we use the Uplink mentoring program to help get our ninth graders acclimated to the high school, and also our new students entering into the high school. It's hugely important to get those kids as comfortable as possible. And so uh, we built a new high school, fortunate enough to open that in 2011, and the Uplink Mentoring Program, and I think you've done some of that also here in Springdale, it works wonderfully. We have a lot of peer tutoring groups. We have minority students who are behind who come to us probably in their high school years, and a lot of those kids haven't, uh, don't speak English. And so to get them acclimated, we use peers to help reduce that stress and help our families uh, move forward. We have the, the safety part that's huge in Northwest Arkansas for families in regard to sports, and so we do a lot of help with families on education for their well-being in terms of the uh, athletic training business. And we do have a separate campus for ALE, but it is fully staffed with training for that. The whole focus here is we mentioned the clinic. We have registered nurses in all of our schools. We have a separate registered nurse supervisor. We have a personal care nurse who is different and a tube feeding nurse that's for our fragile children to help meet their needs uh, we have the five school resource officers so we're committed to the safety if you will of our students uh, we already see that we're a 6a school we're using the bright futures program it's many schools in northwest arkansas are using bright futures it's been fantastic support for kids with basic needs helping us uh, help our families. Our goal was to try to serve those children within a 24 hour period and actually what's happened to us is we're serving them within an hour. We have such a caring community that wants to help kids and, and it's a way for us to pull together to, to meet the needs of our, of our families that are not have as many resources as they need. We're doing the summer meal program. We feed and work with our Boys and Girls Club, feed those kids every day, but we have three mobile sites that go out in the community and we take a literacy uh, take uh, books those children, let them pick what they need so we can keep them reading and meet those kids as much as possible. We're doing the big brothers, big sisters, partnering with Ozark Guidance, using the, doing the snack pack program, so on and so forth. Uh, be honest with you, when we came off of uh, having a weekend where kids pick up their food on Friday and then they're out on Saturday and Sunday and then we're off on um, Martin Luther King Day on Monday and then we worry about not being in school on Tuesday, Everybody's worried about the snow. I'm worried about the kids that don't have food to eat, to be quite frank with you. And, and so that's hugely important that we uh, make that work. Uh, we're uh, very proud of our art program. We have been very successful in that third congressional art district where we've, I think we've won that 11 out of the last 15 years. So we, we value the arts and value, we have a great uh, band director and leadership is important in those programs as we all know. We have the third most vocational offerings of any high school in the state of Arkansas. Uh, I know Springdale's number one, I know Fedville's number two, and we're mighty proud to be number three. So uh, we also, with our CAST program, our Career Academy, and with the conversion uh, charter at the high school, we were able to open up the first industrial maintenance program in the state of Arkansas, and that's that $2 million building that has created so much opportunity for our kids. We're doing Project Lead the Way with the engineering and architecture, and we have eight businesses partnering with us on the internship program that we've started this year. Um, another thing that we wanted to show you is our, our the, the bilingual customer relations program. 
children who have two languages are have a great advantage and we want to capture that skill for them to show them that there's all kinds of possibilities for their future so we use that to help get kids out in the community and realize that they can work in the medical field they can work in the banks they can work in all kinds of professions and use that second language as a way to for them to grow themselves and give them more possibilities we're doing a social media marketing class the AVTF we open our board meetings every a month with a seven minute video from our AVTF where our students produce it, write it, and uh, we do three different segments. That allows us for our board to be up to date on a variety of programs, but it's all done by the students, which is we think is fabulous and been very positive. We've not doing like I saw down here in the hall when I took the tour on the drone program, but we're in that program right now, our teacher's certified, and we plan to take that off next year. Uh, small business entrepreneurship, we plan on using this next year to capture from social media all the way down to bring that together and we want to market that out in our community and see how businesses can use those different groups and coordinate that so it makes a win-win for the kids, for practical experience, for our community members to get some of the skills that, that maybe help promote their business. Um, oh, and I wanted to say one other thing. You see this student right now, this month is career and technical month and uh, we promote our career program simply by having the students promote themselves if you understand what I'm saying and so we've got a variety of these posted all over the school so younger students we want those kids in that career program and that's how we help get that done okay thank you all so much I Megan how'd I do come on He's making sure my feelings aren't hurt. And so he's clearly not talked to Dr. Rollins enough because <laughs> it's very hard to hurt my feelings. Um, I, I want to remind you, you do have note cards. If you do have questions, please jot those down. Just make sure you relate the district that the question goes, goes to. Last but certainly not least, we have a presentation from Bentonville School District. Superintendent Dr. Debbie Jones is going to give you an overview and get you, give you some information. Thank you. I think I just have to begin with one word, and that's grateful. I am grateful to get to be here to work with such outstanding colleagues and educators. Uh, this is the best place in the world to teach, to lead, to learn, and uh, I'm just grateful. I want to share just a little bit about Bentonville Schools. If we're up, there. <laughs> of our community and you know as all the other Northwest Arkansas schools are our communities expect excellence and I think if you watched all the presentations if you walked through our halls and our classrooms and you talked with our teachers and our kids you would leave with one thought and you would leave thinking excellence because that's what we're about in Northwest Arkansas I want to share with you first um, go back just a little slide Okay, we'll start there. That's okay, we'll start right there. No, not there. Um, I wanna share just a little bit about um, our academic performance. And you know, we measure that in many different ways from your ACT scores where our top 10% has an average of 30, about 167 kids, top AP scores, IB scores, top in the state. Um, championship athletic programs and then everything from football to volleyball to lacrosse and a hundred other sports that keep us busy. We have nationally and internationally recognized music and art programs. But there's more than that.
I think they're having a little problem. Success is not, not y'all. I know it's a technical difficulty. Um, success is um, more than winning. It's so much more than test scores and all of those things that I cited. When the superintendents get together at our co-op meetings, we don't discuss who has the highest ACT score, who has the, the most AP test scores in three, fours, or five. With this group of colleagues, we talk about what's best for kids, what innovative programs we can do for kids. And we talk about serving each child within the district and providing opportunities for kids. Of all the things that were mentioned in those schools and ours, um, the opportunities that our kids have in our schools now are amazing. Orchestra starting at the fifth grade, over 75 clubs for every interest that you may have at each one of our high schools. Over 25 AP classes and IB classes and concurrent college credit classes. There is just a menu of opportunities and every student has their niche. Every student can find something, whether that's robotics, whether that's uh, tinkering within the school, creating. We have a place for everyone. When schools talk about personalized learning, public schools do that best because we can offer all kinds of opportunities for students. If you look a little bit, this is amazing. This is one little glimpse of one little sheet of our CAPS booklet. You read across and you look at some of those maths, aside from all of those con college concurrent and the IB and the AP calculus and the AP statistics and the algebra three and the quantitative literacy and it goes on and on and you look at each content, public schools do that best. When we talk about personalized learning, there is that specific academic class or interest class for every one of our students. How can we do this? This is how we do this with outstanding and qualified and loving teachers. If you look at public school teachers and you look in Bentonville, for example, over 60% of our 1,300 teachers have at least a, ma have over a master's degree or higher. They don't get in a classroom, get their teacher certifications and get satisfied. They continue to learn, they continue to lead, and they continue to love. They get better all the time. They're committed to their field. You know, Public education gets a reputation now of testing, and that's what we're all about. And while we are accountable and we do, want, we do want results, that's not really what it's about. If you walk into our elementary schools, you see these very qualified teachers loving these babies. They walk into an environment where we really support creativity. Um, this is a kindergarten class I walked in this year, and that looks like play, but that's really not play. The little girl, their little team was building a mouse house, but she said they ran into a problem. They couldn't figure out how to make a door for their mouse to get into their mouse house. And so the teacher said uh, to the other groups, do you have any ideas for them? So the little boy from the Lincoln Log Center came over and said, yes, you can do this. And I'm like, I never would have thought of that. They're so much smarter than we are, but the creativity is a daily task in our school. Not test prep. Moving on into the middle school, this happens to be a little middle school club that's at Brotwater. And they're learning about culinary arts from real chefs. And you'll see standing behind them, their proud principal, Leslie Lyons. But this is just one example. They have cooking club, they have auto club, they have math club, they have every club that you could think of. Why? Because we know at middle school it's important to see the whole child, to engage them, to develop their character. Moving on, this is one of my favorite students, West High School, Sabo, Sebastian Coniglia. He is a leader. I first met him when he spoke to our Rotary Club. He's a devoted football player who uh, also leads. When we move our kids from elementary to middle, public schools have this reputation of being so big. 
but we're very responsive to that. When they move from each level, we have our student leaders and all of our teams prepare a home for those kids to make them feel comfortable to know that this next place is going to be your home. They also are models of character. They say this is what uh, West High School is all about. These are the standards. And we know that within our halls and within our schools, we're developing leaders, we're developing citizens. We're developing patriotic students who are proud to be in our schools and proud to represent Bentonville. And then within Bentonville schools, we also are very proud to offer plenty of career opportunities with our IGNOT program. Our IGNOT program and others, within our IGNOT program, we have eight different pathways. And if students want to study IT, culinary arts, construction, global business, medical, and many others, um, they not only earn concurrent credits, two and a half hours a day, they go to Bratwater to learn culinary arts. They go to the floor of Walmart and learn how to code for two and a half hours a day. And when this program, program began, Walmart said, we'll take a couple of those kids. And now they're trying to get every one of our Ignite kids that they can get. Why? Because they have proven results. And our students step up to the challenge. When they're asked to do adult work, they produce adult results. The real problem with Ignite is that our kids never want to go home. They want to go code at the REV unit, go take their classes, and then go back and code after work. You see, they're driven and they're engaged, and we found that personalized interest for each one of those students. This happens to be a photographer in our graphic arts class in IT. These are two of our students. You see our female in IT, and we're always recruiting more. They, this is the floor of Walmart. And while they signed confidentiality agreements and they can't tell us everything they're working on with Walmart, um, their reviews from Walmart are very good. And those are two of our start students. This one is now working in virtual reality, the female on the left. We know, we get our task, we understand, and I think you saw this from the committed educators that work with me. We understand that we're building tomorrow for these kids. And we're putting everything that we have into the kids to be successful. And we understand that task and we're living up to the challenge. And so it's been an honor to share just a little bit about Bentonville with you tonight and have a great evening. So the best part is about to start and I'm gonna invite uh, Superintendent Rick Neal to come on up and invite Dr. Jim Rollins to come on up and Dr. Stephen Weber to come on up with Superintendent Ken Ramey and Dr. Debbie Jones. There we go. We'll improvise. There we go. Teamwork. So you had some note cards. If anybody has any note cards, if you will, just lift them in the air and we're gonna have someone come by and pick them up. You can pass them down to the end if you have any. She's coming around that way. Perfect. So we're gonna have a little question and answer session to make sure that uh, if you have any questions or answers, we're gonna ask you to fill that in. Before we do that, I wanna make sure that we recognize everyone who's been a partner here and we've talked about the coalition members that are there. And I want to recognize, uh, you may have noticed her, she's strikingly beautiful uh, as, she, as she walks into a room, you can't miss her. Uh, she is gonna give you an overview of what AEA is all about and I hope you, that you'll take a moment and welcome with me Miss Tracy Ann Nelson. Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you for having me, Dr. Rollins, um, Megan. I want to recognize a few people in the room because without them, this would not be absolutely possible. Our goal with this was to lift up the work of everybody in the community to speak about the good work that we're doing in public schools throughout our state. Um, I want to recognize PTA, who's here, Trina Kuglo. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rich Huddleston of the Arkansas Advocates 
for children and families. <laughs> Chris Pearson, who's our field director um, here in Springdale. And more than anything, I want you to professionals are not just committed, but invested in the success of students. And just so you know, our mantra for this year is every student, every school, every single day. And that's what we are sharing with all of our educators and all of our members throughout the state so that everybody's on board with supporting public education um, and public schools. Also, you have a publication that we put out, The Educator. It's a quarterly piece. And in this, this um, quarterly, we talk about the future is now and the embracing of teaching with technology in public education. Uh, Dr. Rollins talked about the power of collaboration, and we certainly are a part of that. And with our partners, Arkansas School Boards Association, our administrators, Rural Community Alliance, the Arkansas Rural Ed Association, and others, we continue to talk about the good work everybody in this room is doing on public education, so thank you very much. So we have three questions and two microphones. All we need is a turntable. Uh, these three questions are for anyone that's, that's on the panel. So I'm going to ask a question, and um, this will be timed, uh, <laughs> Mr. Ramey. You keep it away from him, Yes, <laughs> yes, because after we wrap up here, we're all going to go back and get more food to eat um, or the to-go plate, whichever you prefer. Perfect. Great. So the, one of the questions is, and this is for any school district that would like to answer, what are you doing to recruit teachers and or administrators that reflect the cultural or ethnic makeup of your student population? We're going to the schools, so we're going to universities in other states and job fairs. We're going to Kansas next week, and we're going to different schools and just recruiting where the students are. Um, not as much diversity coming out of the University of Arkansas when it comes to the School of Education. There's mm -hmm. more diversity in other parts of the U of A that you mm -hmm. see on campus. So we're, we're going to new schools that we've never tried to reach out to before. I think in the past we were solely getting most of our teachers and administrators from the University of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It's a slow process, without question. <clears throat> it's been our experience over time that we can be most fruitful when we grow our own, when we have individuals who actually live in the community or committed to, uh, committed to the community, who understand the culture of the community, who see the contribution that great teachers make. Do any of you give parents any credit for your success? I think that we, in our, inside our community, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate. I think Kenny mentioned about Bright Futures. And I think that any time that you can create a community engagement program, that you can bring parents to the table and, and identify the needs of your community and, and biggest, you know, three years involved with this program, and parents are a part of that. You know, the one fabulous thing I can find about Facebook is, is this initiative right here. So, as we're moving forward in that the parents are so connected into what, what's happening in the district by that piece of community engagement and how it brings everybody together is one of the big platforms I know that we have in our district. And, and I think that we can say that we have um, recognition because uh, they, when they bring kids to school and they're involved in any way, it certainly leads to the success of those children, so whether it's watchdog for dads or whether it's working on the PTO. They pr play a critical role, not just in one or two, not just the PTO, and not just as one-way communication, us talking to them. They're critical in our success within the district, and we recognize that. We've also, through our uh, Panther Health and Wellness, we've had uh, programs where we brought in grandparents, opportunities for parents to join together at night, and we talk about dyslexia and some of those kind of things. I think it's it, the lifeblood of your, and I think I mentioned this, trust that you have with your parents, with your community. Uh, that ha has to be uh, paramount. And so any way and every way that we can link up and communicate effectively, 
makes a winner for our children. So it's a partnership. It has to be. Thank you. To any district, every one of these presentations has focused on the best of the lawmakers in the audience that you need funding and talk about your challenges of not having that wonderful why <laughs> I can speak to that. Um, while we tell of all the benefits of Ignat, at the same time, we're also begging our partners for free rental space. We're asking our vests, how's our kids two days a week? And then the other two days, they go to Moose Sigma two days a week. Uh, we pay rent currently, which is not sustainable. We beg our partners for this space to hold our Ignat program. It is highly successful, but I think you'll agree it's not sustainable because at times when they have to have meetings in those rooms, they put our kids out and we scramble to find places for them. And do we manage? Absolutely. But can we grow and sustain excellent programs like that? We cannot. And so it's critical that we stay committed to public education. Every dollar that we send out to other places is less money for us to function and do all these great things. But we, that's primary, when you see the gray on those guys' heads and you see the wrinkles on our face, it is sticking to a budget and it's tight and we can't do it without support. I think the highlight reels that we had on our videos and our comments just show that there's a return on the investment. So when the public taxpayers invest in public schools, you'll see that return. Maybe the low lights that we did not share would be the struggling learners. And sometimes that's confidential information, whether that's a student with special needs or that's the English language learner. So a lot of the struggling learner stories, that is confidential information that you don't want to highlight in a public forum, but we all have struggling learners and we all are working with teacher leaders, such as the one we had speak with our district tonight. The teacher leaders really are right there at the ground level working with students. And so teacher leaders could say, yes, we need more money for public schools. And if you invest in public schools, you'll see the type of return on your investment and we'll do our best to keep the public's trust. but from the influence of high dollar interest groups in our communities that are trying to divert resources away from public education. Most of those schools have a specific clientele or a specific mission. I think we get labeled sometimes the easy statement when we say one size fits all, that's not public education. You have to have heard that tonight in all the different presentations. We must serve every child, meet their needs and do it with, the, with all of our, our love compassion, dedication, because we have severe needs that reflects our society in our public schools. When we have specific charter schools that get to pick, they call it lottery, but it's not, and they get to choose and we leave out special needs children, we leave out children with, that have transportation issues or that do not other have food security issues, we're really a one size fits all. We're only looking for one type of client, correct? And that's not what we're about across this country. Write this down. You got it? <laughs> what was the number I gave you earlier? In terms of you are good. Good. 85,000 kids. What I want us to think about when we have the conversation regarding dollars and investment in our schools I want you to think about services that those children require. Many of our children live in poverty. Many of our children have special needs. That list can go on and on and on. It requires adequate resources to provide the services for the children. In recent years, our foundation aid has been reduced from 2% two and a half percent annually, which gave us a reasonable shot at meeting those services. And over the last four years, we've looked at less than 1%, 0.81, 0.82%. This past year, just over 1%, 1%. 1 
as we look at the next two years, similar numbers are being projected. We have to make public education a priority without question. We've talked today about, I was so pleased to hear Rick talk about his career in technical programs and Debbie talk about those things and gave great evidence as did Ken and, and certainly we could do the same. There's a great resurgence in our state right now about improving and elevating and investing in career and technical. All of us would be great advocates for that need. But I guess my plea would be, as we think through that process, and I know we have legislators in the room, we can raise this side of the equation up. But if we let the other plateau or fall back, in my opinion, we would have accomplished little or nothing. Clearly, the state is a partner in this process as our local communities. And if you look at the local communities uh, in, our, in our region specifically, local communities are making an enormous commitment, investment in their public schools. The state has to continue to play that role. It's really interesting to hear the term adequacy kind of play it off. <coughs> adequacy in the minds of the school leaders in the room is a technical term. It has all the clout of constitutional law. Adequacy means that the state has a responsibility to make sure that every child in the state, no matter where they reside, has an opportunity for a quality education, to be literate, to be numerate, to have a sound social system behind them. It takes us all working in partnership to breathe life into that equation. I think our appeal would be for everyone in the room who cares deeply about our children and the public schools that serve them, need to remind all concerned that we have to do this together. Local government has a role, state government has a role, in partnership, we've got a chance to continue to take our school forward, but it does require an adequate investment of our resources. Did anybody have else have anything? I hope that you have enjoyed uh, joining us tonight. Before I turn it over to Mr. Mike Mertens with AAEA, I hope that you will look around. We have had some students who have been here uh, streaming this live and working very hard to do so. They've got the camera set up, and so uh, they've gotten everything together along with our technology team. And there are two hardworking ladies that are outside that have food that they're going to put in your purses and or pockets, which whichever. And in the back, I know we recognize Dr. Rollins as principal, but I would also ask that Dr. Rollins stand again as principal, Miss Ann Martfeld, assistant principal. <laughs> Mr. Mertens, I'll turn it over to you. You know, when I I come to events like this and we hear what schools are doing, I'm, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I just, you know, when people talk about the good old days, when I think back when I first started teaching in 1971, I mean, it really was the three R's, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. And what schools are doing today, it absolutely amazes me. And I would, let's give all of our presenters a great, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. So I, I do, I want to end with, uh, we had a question about parent involvement. So uh, we heard from lots of educators, uh, but so what do our parents think about public schools? So I have a poll, and I know we think, oh my God, poll, look what happened to all the polls that came out during our last, you know, presidential election. You, you <laughs> didn't know. But uh, I, I put some credit in this poll because they've been doing it for 49 years. And that's the annual poll. It's, it's a collaboration between Gallup and, and Phi Delta Kappa, and it's the annual poll of public attitudes toward public school. They've been doing it 49 years. So the 2017 poll, 
The number of Americans who gave their community public schools an A is the highest it's been in 40 years. Yes. Yeah. And public schools get their highest grade from those who know them the best, and that's public school parents. You know, if a school is not doing well, well, it, it's the one down the road. It's not, it's not the one that my kid attend. And what do parents want? I mean, that was part of the, of the poll. Uh, Americans overwhelmingly support investments in career preparation and personal skills to ensure that students are prepared for life after high school. We heard lots of examples about that. Most Americans say schools should provide wraparound services for students who need it the most. We heard about interventions. Most public school parents expect their child to continue their, uh, their education after high school, but that doesn't always mean a four-year college. It could be some other type of training. So um, I'm not going to keep you any further. I appreciate everyone that, that came. Uh, I appreciate Springdale for being the, the host tonight. You know, when I, when I reached out to all these schools, they said, well, what do you want me to say? And I said, well, just tell us what you want to share about your school district. They were all a little bit different, but I think totally they did a great job. So thanks to all of y'all, and thank you all for coming, and have a safe trip home.